Uh, many of us hear the word history and they imagine dusty bookshelves and antiquated information. But knowing where we've been is actually a great way to help discover and design where we want to go. And we're lucky enough to have someone join us today who knows what it's like to create something great, a little program called Visual Studio Code. Please welcome Eric Gamma. Hello. Welcome, Eric. Before working welcome, on Eric. VS Code, Eric also worked on Breakthrough Eclipse development environment and their Java development tooling. And before he did that, he wrote a, a little book, actually. I think I've got a, I've got a <laughs> copy of it here. That's you, Eric, isn't it? That's me. And you know my ground rule? You don't have to read it, you only have to buy it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I did both of them, actually, so thank you very much for that. <laughs> I'm sorry um, about that, yeah. <laughs> Imagine how old this book is, right? It has examples from Windows presentation managers in there and so on. It's pretty amazing how old <laughs> it's to work. This is my 18-year-old copy of this book, and, and I do admit, until about a week ago, it was, it was helping lift the verticalness of my monitor, but it has been very well read and very well worn uh, until that point. So thank you very much for so that. I will sign it when we see it, I promise. Ah. <laughs> yeah, I will take it. Be before we get started, uh, I, I would love to present a few presents for you, Eric. Um, so here's a thing. Yes. Happy awesome. birthday. It is actually a Thank special you. week for VS Code, isn't it? Yeah, it, it is. is. I, have a, I have another it's present for you as well here, Eric. Show me. I have a little, a little birthday card, and inside it says, hope it's a rawsome fifth birthday. Rawsome fifth <laughs> birthday, and that's because it is, is it not? It is uh, Visual Studio Code's fifth birthday right now, isn't it? It's correct. It's correct. And we got some other great birthday presents, right? So, so having such a say, it's the worst, world's most popular editor. In his keynote, of course, is, is a nice, nice statement. And also another birthday present for which you had to do some sweating for is, of course, Code Sandbox, right? Where you see VS Code running in the browser. So that's, it's a great first day for me already. And I cannot say how happy I am and how proud I am for the team that made it all happen, right? We're, we're all very, very grateful as well for VS Code and we're celebrating together with all of you. And we actually thought <laughs> that it would be a great idea on VS Code's birthday to talk about its history and how it was created and kind of the journey from there to now. Um, and although VS Code is five years old, I know that you actually joined Microsoft nine years ago. Uh, can you tell us why you joined and what was your mission back then? Yes, so uh, I joined Microsoft nine years ago. Uh, I had some contact with Microsoft before. We were talking what kind of project I would find challenging because I told them I would be interested in a new challenge, but it has to be a really good one. And it never clicked until Jason Sander was visiting Zurich and telling me, would you be interested to explore what you can do with coding in the browser, right? Coming on the vision, we have tools as good as Visual Studio, but running in the browser. And that just clicked, that was nine years ago. And fortunately, some of my team members that worked at that point at IBM joined me and they were as excited as I am. And the nice thing is you were a small team in Zurich and the mission was, you run like a startup and explore what's possible to do that, right? And the first thing we picked is having an editor that runs in the browser, a code editor, but so that they don't notice you run in the browser, right? This was from the beginning. Performance was very important for us from the beginning, right? Developers are very performance sensitive and we knew that. And fortunately, the browsers became much better at that time. As you see, if you look at the VS Code history, right? There was just so many happy moments and this happy moment was the browsers are really good. The JavaScript engines are really good now. So it's a really time that you can start to think about it. And we built this Monaco editor. And as a good startup, right, we found also people at Microsoft that adopted it, that kind of funded us. And that's how we got running, right? OneDrive was using it. The F12 tools are using it. And yeah, it was a great time. This was the first kind of deliverable we have was the Monaco editor in 2011. Still use today, still with as a separate component. 
Yeah, and that's I think that's something I I, I only found out, which is that the journey started nine years ago, kind of the early years and kind of before VS Code was was learned properly. But you also worked, or you have a lot of experience on the Eclipse platform as well. What were some of the mistakes you learned from the Eclipse, your days working on Eclipse, and you made sure to avoid when working on Visual Studio Code? Uh, Eclipse made many things right, right? So um, what we, what I still think is great about Eclipse, the, the, the story that you have plugins, extensibility, that's really great, right? What we kind of underestimated, uh, no matter how cool extensions are, an, ex an extension can hurt you as a platform, right? When an extension behaves in a bad way, is slow, runs an infinite loop or whatever, right? It can hurt how your tool behaves. And that's something that we didn't want to repeat, right? And when we designed our extension story, we paid a lot of attention to protect the core tool from misbehaving extensions. And the architectural move we did there was to say we isolate extensions by having them run in a separate process. And of course, if you run in a separate process, you don't impact our startup performance that much. If you run an endless loop, the main core tool can still continue, can still save your file. And this was a very wise decision that we did based on the motivation from Eclipse where we saw how you can suffer if you don't really protect yourself from extensions. The other lessons you can look at is kind of the importance of a designed API. I wouldn't say the Eclipse API wasn't designed, but given that we have our extensions run in a separate process, we have full control over what an extension can do, right? It's an RPC channel and we control which messages can run. So it's totally controlled what the API is. And we spend a lot, spend a lot of effort to make this API consistent and pleasant to use and really abstract from the internals, right? There is you don't see any internals through our API. You really see the view that an extension developer should see to make him productive writing an extension. I, I think I, I speak on behalf of all developers out there um, about how much we love the VS Code extensions. Like one of my favorite extensions is actually the Azure Functions extension, uh, but really grateful for, for that. Um, and I remember, Eric, so you talked about extensions and you talked about um, API design. Um, and five years ago, when you released uh, VS Code at Build and you announced the beta version of it, what what did it uh, what did the first that first version look like? Um, did it include the extensions and the this wonderfully well designed API? Was there anything else that was part of that initial version? No, glad you asked. No, nothing of that existed when we announced it. Right, the beta version what we had is we wanted to show uh, we we come late to the market, right? And what we wanted to show in the beta version is how we differ from all the others in the market, like Sublime, uh, Atom, all those. And we really focus on this difference. And this means you want to show that you have rich language support, right? which we love from IDEs like Visual Studio and also Clips, right? IntelliSense, Find All Reference. That's just something we like a lot. And we want to, in a spectrum, right? If you have here the full IDE and you have an editor, you want to be a little bit closer to the IDE. And in the beta, what we want to show off was this rich language support, which we showed for TypeScript and C Sharp. And we want to show debugging, right? This is the only thing we showed there. We had no API, we had no extension architecture in place, and we had no open source architecture in place. This took us another six months. And I know six months after six months, you actually uh, released the beta into open source, and you did that in a oh, yeah. very dramatic way. Can you can you remind <laughs> us how? Well, it was you know, it was this connect conference and uh, live on stage, right? You go to the GitHub uh, settings page, you scroll down, and then you say make this repository public. You enter the repository name again, and then everybody in the world can see what you build. This was, it was a great moment. It required quite some work, right? You have to separate our code into what we call a distro and the open source portion so that all the branding assets and the services we use are not 
uh, part of the open source because license wise doesn't work. So that's why we had to make this distro open source code base split. And that's why this moment to push the button was quite dramatic and was fun, right? And the next step at the same time, we also showed for the first time an extension in action. And this was actually the Go language extension, which we showed our vision that you want to provide deep language support for many languages. And we did that for Go. This was the first kind of demo of that, which was a cool and moment. That was a connect conference, yeah. And it does it does sound like you've laid out all this work uh, from right from the beginning so that you could um, open source VS code right from the start. was that was that the intention? No, no, keep in mind, this code base was already five years old. and um, of course, eventually in mind, if you want to come to them to the to this market with lots of open source players like Atom, most clearly we have to be open source. But uh, no, no, we had to cleanse our code, right? We had a long list of checkboxes, what you all have to do and correct language, right? And so on, what you do. But no, no, this was real work. In six months, we cleansed the code that we could make it and share with the public without that we have to be embarrassed, right? Mm -hmm. So well, we reduced I, I the number before... of to-dos and so on. Go ahead. Yeah, I wish we were all as productive as you and team are <laughs> in six months, cleaning up all the source code so that it's ready for open source. Now, you did mention Plus that the extension uh, architecture. Was Sorry, I, I, it was very intense. In these six months, we also did the extension architecture, came out with this extension host uh, architecture, which then later on enabled so many other scenarios. Yeah. Yeah, and you, you've mentioned Golang there, um, but I, I'm wondering who are some of the early adopters of uh, VS Code? Um, that's actually, that was a good question, right? So we, that was one of our big fears we have. Nobody will come and write extensions for us because Atom is in the market with 4,000 extensions already. So who would come to us? Of course, initially it was really, we dog fooded it ourselves, right? So we made, all the things you had bundled at beta, like the TypeScript support or the C Sharp support, we all migrated that uh, into extensions, right? And then we had many internal partners that joined us and helped us to make this happen, right? So um, the languages were the first one, then Azure came soon, soon after, right? And you, you mentioned you like these Azure extensions. They had quite a longer journey, right? And they helped us also to improve our API because they come back. You want to really make our Azure extension better, but your UI, your API doesn't allow this in that feature. So it was a great collaboration initially with internal partners. And then we were just blown away how much interest we got externally, right? Because um, today we have 18,000 extensions I just checked before the call and wow. I couldn't believe it, right? Which is amazing. So you were hired to actually build the online browser experience. Um, but VS Code was originally released yeah. as a desktop application. Why did you make that decision at the start? Oh, okay. Yeah, that's a good, good part of the history, right? We really started with the Monaco editor uh, in the browser. And then even in 2013, we announced VS Online Monaco, which was a, uh, a setup that you could edit an Azure app service in the browser. I think it's still there if you look, use the old app services, the non-container-based one. And what we saw there, uh, we got some users, but the usage was pretty low. So like any good startup, you have to decide, do we pivot or persevere? And when we saw the number of users, right, so 3,000 or 5,000 users we had there for, for Microsoft, that's hard to be relevant with this number of users. So we decided to make a pivot and switch to a desktop application, leveraging the web technology we have. And again, it's one of these happy moments in time. Just at this time, a Node WebKit became available, right, which allows you to run a, a JavaScript application that uses Node APIs as a desktop application. And that was re-enabled that. And this was, and I think in November 2014, six months before we shipped the beta, we decided to pivot away from a web IDE to a desktop IDE. Uh, editor, desktop editor, of course, yeah. 
And that was an important pivot. And it was great that we had this uh, technology that later became Atmichel and then Electron, which really enabled us this cross-platform shipping. Right? Think about it. We ship every month on three platforms at the same time. Right? And uh, shipping on a platform is never for free, but Electron really helps us to reduce the cost, cost because Chromium already makes sure all the graphic engine events and so on works cross-platform. So this was this important pivot that uh, I'm glad you mentioned it. Yeah, that was yeah. I mean, an important one. Hearing, hearing, hearing you talk, there really is just a set of happy accidents, exact moments when things happen on the journey to Visual Studio Code to now. And, and recently, we've released, or you've released, the online version of Visual Studio Code. And we seem to have come full circle to that dream of, of kind of nine years ago having an online editor. Can you tell people a little bit of the challenges that you had turning the desktop version of Visual Studio Code into the online version of Visual Studio Code? Okay, as you know, we were an online version, right? We ran fully in the browser. We had some Node backend that served files and so on. And then we moved to the desktop electron-based version, which allowed us to add Node dependencies and access to file system directly from the the renderer process, the core of VS Code. And when we decided we want to go back to the browser, we had to kind of refactor the code base so that all these shortcuts, if you want, become nicely engineered, right? And the way we did it is we always worked in the VS Code core with service injection. So we just inject services like, you know, for dialog, we have an injection for the desktop. And you have an injection for the browser, right? Where you use HTML on the desktop. Uh, Electron gives you native API to show a native dialog. And that was what it architecturally, and that took us quite some time to get there. This was most on the rendering side. But what was also a very important challenge is extensions, right? So uh, when we did uh, this VS Online Monaco five years ago, seven years ago, we had no extensions, and we were really not sure what to do. And extensions are a key part of VS Code. Now, since you mentioned happy moments, right? We had another happy moment in between getting to the browser. And this was when WSL came along. And WSL allows you to have Linux running on your Windows box. And then what you can do is you run install the tools like Ruby or Python on the Linux box. Right. And now the happy moment is we had this challenge. How can we support that? Right. You run VS Code on the Windows side, but your tools run in WSL uh, on, the, on the Linux side. And the happy moment was this challenge. This made us think about, given that we have this extension host architecture, what would it mean if you run extensions not locally, but remotely? Okay, so with WSLE, we start to explore, uh, uh, can we run extensions remotely where the tools are, which means on the WSL side. And this eventually then resulted in the VS Code remote extensions. And the VS Code remote extensions, they build on a VS Code server, which runs the extension host remotely. So it's, I'm a little bit long-minded maybe, but you see where I'm getting it. This VS Code server running extensions remotely was then critical for the web portion because once you have this VS Code server, you can run this VS Code server in a backend in a container, and the extensions again work for the browser. So I understand. So in order to get it working with WSL, you have to make it work remotely on the same computer, and then the, then it was a simple jump to go from remotely in the same computer to remotely remotely, and then in the online world there. It sounds like you used a lot of yeah. really maybe, good, maybe I can insert. Uh, yeah. ah. Let me insert. Go. Yeah, insert. We had the WSL scenario, which is totally local. Then we had also the SSH box scenario, right? Many people, you have an SSH connection to a VM, and then they use Vim to edit, and great, right? But we use the same architecture, then run the VS Code server in the SSH box, connect to it, from your desktop and then you get the VS Code experience using the VS Code extensions also in the SSH setup. And the third scenario is you have a local Docker container and you run all your tools in there, right? This gives you this isolated sandbox. So you see that was just 
good decisions or good challenges happen at the right time that forced us to think of architectures which then enable these things which we now have with Code Sandbox. Or maybe you could say there were some good design patterns being used. There. <laughs> my team, my team would laugh at me, right? <laughs> no, my team is really mature, and uh, you know, we do the design patterns have lived sometimes the smell is object oriented, too much object oriented. My team loves functional style, JavaScript, TypeScript is a wonderful language, give you all the 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 power of functional programming, right? So. I would not give too much credit for my design pens. I would really give credit to the talent of the team to use the language in a really good way and TypeScript, right? And at birthday time, you also have to say thank you. Maybe sometimes I would really say a big thanks to TypeScript because you cannot maintain a JavaScript code base uh, over nine years that grows uh, without TypeScript, right? Even my team once coined the term, no, writing code in JavaScript is like carving code in stone because you're afraid to change it. With TypeScript, right, you can refactor code and find all references and so on. So we no longer do that. And that was one of the tools that helped us to survive nine years of continuous JavaScript coding in a large code base, right? It's not a small code base. And we have refactored quite significantly over time. It sounds, Eric, that there was a lot of collaboration between the TypeScript team, the VS Code team, the Electron team, and it sounds like there were uh, a lot of things happening that actually made VS Code uh, possible and made it be so amazing as it is uh, today. Um, and that's such an amazing story. Um, but I'm wondering also, like this build. One thing, no, one announced... thing. Sorry, sorry, I have to say one thing. Yeah. Can I say one thing? It's, it's, it's more, yep. right? Because Electron gives us the Node ecosystem. If you look at our um, readme or what is the license file, you see, I guess, use over 300 Node modules, right? It's also a great op open source uh, collaboration, right? It's, it's really, it's big, right? And it's, it's, it's fun to see that. Sorry, I interrupted you. Oh, no, don't worry. <laughs> uh, I was actually about to ask if, um, during build, we've also announced a couple of new features of VS Code, uh, and I, I wanted to maybe ask you if you can share some of uh, some of the ones that uh, you are most passionate about uh, and you're excited about. So, uh, of course, um, code sandboxes, right? This is just the vision we had nine years ago become true. And what's exciting about that is really the, the collaboration required to that, right? Of course, the VS Code team had to make sure that VS Code runs in the browser again. Uh, we had to make sure um, all the requirements that we integrate seamlessly, or as seamless as it makes sense, right, in, in the GitHub UI. Then we had the backend team, which is the Visual Studio Code Spaces team, right? They implement the backend team, the provisioning of the containers that you uh, use and set up when you connect uh, to a code space. And of course, the GitHub team that brought it all together, right? So that's that's a huge announcement, right? And that makes me totally proud because it's, it's nine, in a way, it's a nine year long journey that finally happened, right? So that's really cool. There were some other ones like, you know, um, GitHub brought VS Code into um, GitHub. What we now also do is we bring more of GitHub into VS Code. And the way we do it, we do it the, the Eclipse way, the VS Code way, uh, by using extensions for that, right? So one of the extensions we have enriched recently is uh, the GitHub pull request extension which we announced a year ago, which allows you to manage pull requests in VS Code. We have now enriched it with issues so that whenever you reference, refer to issues or users from GitHub, we show you a nice hover, you give you IntelliSense to insert it and so on. So that's pretty nice and shows kind of a piece, this nice, uh, better together, right? So um, GitHub is cool with GitHub VS Code, with the GitHub extension can make GitHub even cooler, right, when you work in VS Code. So that's some of the announcements that I remember that come at a build related to VS Code. Yeah. And of that's course, the now, extensions, which, you know. Yeah. So now we, we, we've covered the early years. We've covered the present. We've caught up with the present, as I say. Let's talk about the future. What does the future hold 
for Visual Studio Code. Can you give us some hints, perhaps, on some future plans? So one trend we observed, right? I want to talk about two things, right? The one trend we observed is the, the, how much uh, data scientists love Jupyter Notebooks, how they collaborate with it, how they explore their data with Jupyter Notebooks. And it's such a, a powerful metaphor, right? You have some kernel, you have some cells, and you then tell the kernel, run this cell, and you get some output, and they have it nicely presented in a notebook. And the Python extension for VS Code does that. And what we saw over time, well, this notebook metaphor is more general, right? And what if we would build the basic notebook experience? You have cells, you have some kernel, you have output into VS Code itself as a first, first class concept like the Monaco editor. And the big benefit for that is if you do that, you can leverage existing extensions like themes, key binding extensions. So imagine you could use the Vim key binding extension also for notebook. But moreover, uh, one thing, uh, concept of a notebook is you have renderers, right? How you render the cell output. And imagine you can now manage, leverage VS Code extensions for these renderers, right? So I guess it could be a very nice story if we have a core basic abstraction of notebooks in VS Code. We have some extension mechanisms that it can contribute renders. And then we have different kernels, different backends that can use this notebook metaphor, not only limited to Jupyter notebooks. So that's, that's this uh, notebook um, work we started now and it's uh, on our plans and, and we have one example is we have a GitHub notebook extension and the GitHub notebook extension basically allows you to run GitHub queries, right? So when we do an end game, we have 10 different queries we always run, right? Open issues, test plan items and so on. Uh, very few issues which need verifications. And so it, within one notebook, we can present you all these results from these queries and we use the notebook metaphor, but a totally different backend, right? We just talk to GitHub directly with issue queries, like our kernel is GitHub and issue queries uh, support they have. So that's something, that's an extension on the marketplace, the GitHub issues extension, that gives you an idea, that's for us also dog fooding thing, right? So whatever, whenever we do something, we like to dog food on it. And this allows the dog food on the, on the notebook APIs you build. Yeah. Of course, it's also with the Zulu new kind of APIs. So that's okay. the first thing. The other thing we, we start to look at is, and what we also find exciting is, uh, which uh, what can we do to make, to run more code in the browser? And that also gives us, goes back a little bit to VS Online Monaco. At that time, we were running TypeScript, the intelligence and everything all in the browser. And that is an interesting, concept, right? Think about how much you can run in the browser without needing a full backend. It's of course more cost effective, but can also be more efficient. And one example of this uh, scenario is for instance, LiveShare, a very important VS Code extension, allows you now to connect from the browser, right? Without any installer backend. And this all happens through extensions that run in the browser. And this is a good example of where we like to invest in kind of running more extensions like you know, the live share uh, guest extension directly in the browser. That's amazing. And, and I yeah. have to say, I love Visual Studio Code. I love Jupyter Notebooks. Just the, just the idea of merging the, the mechanisms together is, is making me really, really excited. We still have a lot of fun work ahead of us, I agree, yeah. I, I am excited for the future and I'm excited about everything that VS Code will unlock for us from a development perspective. Uh, thank you so much for being our guest at Build, Eric. That was extremely fascinating. Yeah, I agree. My pleasure what a here. great origin story. Thank you. Sorry. What thank a you. great origin story. Thank, thank, thank you for Visual Studio <laughs> Code. Well, thank the team. To, thank the team. <laughs> I keep yeah. on talking over you. I'm so sorry. Now over to Christine in Redmond. 
Thank you so much, Simona and Asim and Eric. It was so great hearing about the history of Visual Studio Code, and I'm super excited about seeing all those new features from uh, the guy who knows it super well. So coming up, we will hear about a real world case study that began during the pandemic. That and more after a short break. Stay tuned.